Good morning to everyone here. Uh, just an, a bit of an introduction that uh, we have uh, quite a number of participants uh, attending your session, Phil. And we would like to uh, have a sound check with all the participants not at Recfon. Could you please wave through the chat box? Could you wave through the chat box that you can hear us? Yeah, somebody respond. Done. Uh, yes, it's clear. Okay. So I think we are pretty much on the right track. Okay. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Again, good morning uh, and probably good afternoon if you are uh, joining us uh, elsewhere, not in Jakarta. Uh, for you, Phil, in front of you, if you notice that there are some uh, pretty ladies sitting. <laughs> they are actually our master student of nutrition uh, study program, uh, Faculty of Medicine Jakarta. They are waving now. Uh, yeah, I, and yeah, I can see them. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, so a bit of introduction. So Dr. Phil Baker here is uh, one of the research fellow at Deakin University. Uh, he is also a member of the Institute for Physical Activity and Nutrition at Deakin University. He has led or is leading World Health Organization funded project on topics related to what he is going to talk today. Uh, he is a member of the independent expert group of the Global Nutrition Reports. I am sure many of us have been using this report lately. And he was recently a fellow of the Lancet Commission of Obesity. The title that uh, Phil is going to talk about is really about something that is um, in the in the. Uh, trend, trending topics uh, among the nutritionists. So we are hoping that through the lecture or sharing from Phil, we can also uh, be enlightened in terms of what processed foods are we talking about and what nutrition transition are we uh, facing here in Southeast Asia. Um, we are hoping also to see whether from uh, uh, Phil's talk, there, there is going to be some exploration on policy and regulatory uh, action taken in various countries in Southeast Asia. So, Phil, hopefully that is a uh, uh, nice introduction, hopefully. So, if you would like to add some more on the background of what you have studied, uh, please do so. So, time is yours, uh, Phil. Thank you so much, Judy. And just to confirm, um, I'll, I'll speak for about 45 minutes to 50 minutes, and then we'll leave some time for um, discussion afterwards. Is that is that about right? Okay. Um, so it's it's really fantastic to to be with you all today, and thank you so much, Judy, for the um, the warm introduction. Um, uh, I met Judy recently uh, when she was at. Um, visiting us at Deakin University uh, here in Melbourne. And since then, we have been uh, keeping in touch and collaborating. My background is as a uh, nutritionist. So I, uh, I studied biological sciences, and then I studied public health nutrition. I also studied nutrition science, um, and I worked 
through this um, this dietary and nutritional and epidemiological transition. Okay, so the idea is that uh, as countries become more urbanized, as they become richer, as their economies grow, as we start to see uh, technological change, uh, as we see changes. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> that was my Siri. Um, as we start to see changes in um, technology and lifestyles, and also as we start to see um, technological change in the food system, so new manufacturing technologies, new agricultural technologies, um, what people eat begins to change, and so does their nutrition status. So the idea is that, um, that, that populations transition from traditional diets uh, rich in staple foods and vegetables tending to be lower diversity towards higher diversity, uh, more diverse diets, higher in uh, vegetable oils, uh, sweeteners, more animal source foods, and meat in particular, and, um, excuse me, and also more, <coughs> excuse me, I just uh, caught something in my mouth, uh, also more highly processed foods. And so as countries transition, from these um, go through this dietary transition they also transition from a disease burden characterized primarily by um, undernutrition and hunger and later on towards um, uh, one characterized by obesity and diet related chronic diseases um, and then finally at the very end of this transition um, some populations trans start to transition back towards or, or start to transition towards healthier uh, diets and lifestyles. And you see a reduction in obesity and diet-related um, NCDs. Now, this is just a theoretical framework, okay? So there's no um, single nutrition transition. This is, just a, a, this is just a set of concepts for sort of guiding how we think about how diets and how nutrition and, and health changes over time as countries um, uh, become uh, go through these stages of development. But it does raise, it's a really useful theory um, because it helps us um, generate a lot of interesting questions. And one of the questions is, why do some countries um, go through this transition? Or why do we see some countries making this transition but not other countries? That's, all, that's been primarily my main interest in applying this theory, is that if we take all of the countries in the world, there are 210 countries in the world. Um, some some countries will go, we see them going through this transition. Other countries will uh, not so much go through this transition. They might, um, they might not go through this transition at all, or they might not transition to unhealthy diets at all. Um, and we've seen this in some countries like Japan, like South Korea, in our region, where um, they haven't followed the same transition as we're seeing in other countries like Mexico or South Africa, which have gone much more towards a high obesity and a high um, uh, prevalence of diet-related chronic diseases. So that to me is really interesting. Why do we see these differences in these countries? Okay, in terms of what this... Uh, Let's see if I can just change my slide here. So what does this actually look like when we say how is the, the world, uh, how is the world food supply changing? Well, when we look at um, the calorie supply from different types of foods around the world, the predominant bulk of those calories come from, come from cereals, um, uh, wheat and rice in particular. Um, and then we, when we take cereals out of the picture, we can see that um, most of those calories uh, come from sugar and sugar supply. The sugar supply has increased, uh, but not by not by a huge amount over the last um, since 1960. Um, we've seen a huge increase in the supply of meat around the world. Um, we're seeing some increase in dairy and fruits and vegetables, uh, fats and oils, in particular fats and oils in uh, low income and middle income countries. And we've also seen an increase in the supply of fish and, and seafood. Okay, so these are some general trends that we see in the in the world food supply. Uh, 
of course, this is playing out very differently in different regions and different countries around the world. But it gives some background, I guess, to how this nutrition transition, or how the dietary transition is playing out um, at, at a world, um, at, at the level of the world food supply. When we talk about processed foods, um, processed foods weren't really a big part of the nutrition transition theory proposed by Dronowski and Popkin. It wasn't until studies um, that were much more recent that uh, public health nutritionists really started to pay attention to the role of processed foods in the nutrition transition. Um, and now we'd say that they are really uh, a key component. So there's this idea that um, as countries transition, they shift from diets that are predominantly unprocessed and minimally processed foods. So those are foods that tend to be uh, high in vegetables, for example, or higher in cereals, um, to diets that are higher in processed, and in particular, ultra-processed foods. And when we look at some high-income countries today, you'll see that the, the the, the majority of calories are actually supplied from ultra-processed foods. So in the, U, in the United States, for example, we see about 60% of the calories uh, supplied to the uh, US population come from uh, ultra-processed foods. So these are really uh, ultra-processed diets. Um, the share of ultra-processed foods in, um, in, in diets in low-income in lower middle income countries is a lot less. But what we see when we look at trends over time, and this graph here shows the volume of, of uh, the per capita volume of processed foods and beverages um, sold in um, low and middle income countries versus high income countries. And we see that uh, ultra processed food markets or um, uh, markets for uh, packaged foods, processed foods, oils and fats, snack bar, snacks and snack bars, for example, and soft drinks are rapidly growing in low and middle income countries, in particular for soft drinks. Um, this is in contrast to high income countries where we see um, very little to, uh, to, and in some cases, negative growth in certain product categories. So this sort of gives some indication that high income countries are in the middle to late phase of their processed food nutrition transition and low and middle income countries are going through a nutrition transition to diet to uh, which is includes these diets that are higher in, uh, in in processed foods okay so when we talk about um why does this even matter for public health um why does this matter for nutrition so food processing has uh, played an important role in food production and in human nutrition for um, thousands of years. And we know this, right, in terms of, um, you know, the processing of rice, um, the drying and the salting of fish, um, the, the drying and the salting of meats, um, the fermentation of different foods. And we see, you know, fermentation is something that occurs in a number of um, countries in Asia. Um, and, and in many ways, food processing has played this really important role in food production, in food culture, and in human nutrition. And so, and there are lots of positive uh, aspects of food processing. So you can um, preserve foods, extend their, um, their, their shelf life, for how long they last for, uh, in some cases, you can improve the nutritional properties of foods by, for example, fermentation. Um, so there are lots of, uh, and in many cases, you can improve the taste of, of foods as well. So food processing uh, plays uh, this really important role. Um, however, uh, something has really changed um, only really recently in human history, and that is the scale of processing and the extent of processing has increased um, dramatically. So um, we've seen this, uh, this, this large-scale industrialization of food processing and this creation of uh, what we'd call a new category of foods, ultra-processed foods, that were almost entirely unavailable to pre-industrial humans. So this is sort of before the 1800s, 
these types of ultra processed foods were not really part of the human diet. It's only really since the um, since the industrial revolution, and then it's only really since the 1970s have we seen the truly um, the globalization of ultra processed foods. So this is when these foods have become uh, available on a truly global scale. So this to me is really interesting. Um, if this this new category of foods that we call ultra processed foods has really only become globally available in the last 50 years, what are the implications for this? So first of all, to understand the role of processing in um, nutrition and health, um, we need some way of kind of understanding um, diff what um, the, the health implications of different types of processed foods. And so there are a number of schemas for classifying foods by their degree of processing. The most widely used um, schema is the, the NOVA schema um, developed by Carlos Montero and colleagues in Brazil. And they categorize foods into four main categories. The first are uh, uh, unprocessed and minimally processed foods. So these are your whole foods like fruits, vegetables, seafood, um, meats, eggs, what, what they call processed um, culinary ingredients. So this is, uh, these are processed foods that are used in uh, primarily in cooking. It includes products like uh, butter, vegetable oil, table salt, um, honey, for example. The third category are what we call processed foods. So they have, these are foods that have gone, undergone uh, a process of transformation, usually a process of transformation to extend their shelf life, uh, to preserve them. And this includes products like cheese, uh, breads, canned fish, canned vegetables, um, and, and, and pickled um, uh, foods. The fourth category of foods, and these are really the, the main um, uh, concern when we talk about processed foods and health, are the ultra-processed foods and, uh, and drinks. So these are, you know, snack foods, um, ultra-processed ultra -processed breads, um, microwave meals, sugar-sweetened beverages, um, confectionery, um, various dairy products, and what we see, um, one of the defining features of ultra-processed foods is that they often have uh, cosmetic additives um, added to them. The cosmetic additives are things like flavorings, emulsifiers, stabilizers, um, uh, various, um, various ingredients that change the, uh, the mouthfeel, the taste, um, various properties of the food. And this is important because, um, first of all, these ingredients, these additives, are thought to play an important role in health in that they can be harmful to health in some ways, but they also increase the uh, palatability of these foods. So the, the taste, the mouthfeel, the smell, the visual properties of the food, which uh, is a cause for concern because um, they can, that can lead to uh, overconsumption. And, and people, uh, nutritionists, do not tend to use the term addiction because the biological pathways around addiction are slightly different. But some people use the term quasi-addictive. Uh, these are foods that um, or, or hyper, uh, hyper palatable. These are foods that are very um, easy to, to overconsume. Okay, so when we look at the evidence, um, what, is the, what, are the, what, are the, what does the evidence say in terms of the links between ultra-processed foods, nutrition, and health, uh, and in particular, health outcomes? So just, uh, we've really started to see an explosion in this type of research in the last 10 years, and there have been a number of really important studies published just in the last few, few years, which tell us some really interesting um, findings about ultra-processed foods in particular. Okay, so the first thing that we find is that um, diets that uh, tend to be higher or contribute more to um, diets that tend to be higher in ultra-processed foods are associated, first of all, 
with poorer dietary quality. And on the graph you can see on the right hand side here really shows this. So these are um, different categories of processed foods as organized by the, the NOVA classification. And what we can see is that um, uh, that um, when we look at ultra unprocessed foods, these are largely fruits and vegetables, meat, poultry, and fish. Um, <clears throat> small amount of dairy, a uh, small amount of grains, beans, nuts, and seeds. So this is a, a, um, a profile of what you'd see for unprocessed foods. For processed foods, we start to see a shift. So we start to see um, a greater share of grains start to come in, for example. When we look at ultra-processed foods, we can see that the grains make up a much higher proportion. So do fats and sweeteners. Um, so do dairy. Um, and these whole foods, um, which which are ingredients in ultra-processed foods, make up a much uh, lower proportion. So this really tells us uh, something that's really key, which is that diets are higher in ultra-processed foods uh, tend to result in um, uh, poorer dietary quality, in particular, uh, reduced consumption of nutrient-dense foods like vegetables, fruits, and animal source foods. Okay, when we look at the cross-sectional and cohort studies, we also see that um, diets higher in ultra-processed foods are associated with an increased risk of all-cause mortality, and there's a couple of really good uh, papers published in the British Medical Journal recently which uh, demonstrated this. Also, obesity, various cardiometabolic diseases, uh, certain cancers, including breast cancer, uh, gastrointestinal disorders, and asthma. And these are just a few of the um, a few of the conditions that these studies are starting to find associations with now. Okay, we see. Um, I think there's one or two randomized control trials now that find a relationship with increased risk of excessive weight gain and insulin resistance. And there's also some uh, cohort studies which have found increased risks of certain um, the consumption of certain types of ultra processed foods. So that's, for example, sugar sweetened beverages, fast foods, processed meat, with increased cardiovascular risk, and and certain cancers. So the I'd say the evidence base is uh, becoming uh, quite strong in terms of linking um, ultra processed foods with poor nutritional and um, dietary, nutritional, nutritional, and health outcomes. Okay, so when we look at, um, so so one of the key questions that we have to ask is if we if we are starting to see um, epidemiological evidence for a relationship for for an association between ultra processed foods and negative health outcomes, what are the mechanisms that might link ultra processed foods with those health outcomes? Okay, so a number of different um, mechanisms have been proposed. First of all, ultra-processed foods tend to have a poorer uh, nutrient profile, so they tend to be um, higher in salt, sugar, uh, trans fats. They tend to have um, a higher um, energy density um, than uh, unprocessed and minimally processed foods, um, for example. Uh, they displace fresh and unprocessed or minimally processed foods, um, high in fiber and other protective nutrients in the diet. They also um, have altered physical and, and structural characteristics, which are thought to result from the processing of foods themselves. And also, like I, I mentioned earlier, um, adding um, because these foods can the, these foods contain these uh, so-called industrial or cosmetic additives, and these have been linked with higher uh, glycemic responses of the foods, uh, lowered satiety signaling. So this is a, a reduced signaling of fullness um, to the brain uh, following consumption. And also um, that the, the idea I mentioned earlier of hyper palatability. So these altered characteristics of the foods that result from processing can lead to um, overconsumption. Others have also proposed that these foods um, generate inflammatory responses, and some of these inflammatory responses are linked with some of these industrial food additives. There's also disruptions to the um, the gut micro gut micro, microflora. 
and increased intestinal, intestinal permeability. Uh, and this is a really interesting and, and quickly evolving field of study um, that is linking ultra-processed foods with um, poor health outcomes, especially cardiometabolic um, uh, health outcomes. Finally, um, there have been some studies um, and um, ideas put forward that uh, that um, uh, of, of endocrine disruption resulting from these chemical plasticizers, um, which are thought to leach from the plastic packaging um, into food. Uh, and some of these endocrine disruptors have been uh, linked with uh, overweight obesity, uh, for example. But this is all emerging um, research. So I think we're going to see some really interesting and important um, findings in this area over the next um, five to 10 years. Okay, so when we talk about nutrition, the nutrition transition and processed foods, um, the question that I've asked in my research previously is why do some countries and regions transition to diets high on processed foods, but others do not? Okay, and so um, a few years ago, uh, back in 2016, I did this work for the Global Panel on Agriculture and Food Systems and Food Systems for Nutrition. They asked me to look at processed food sales around the world and to look at trends uh, and patterns over time. And what I found was when I looked at the uh, processed food sales by region, uh, we really saw this um, huge increase in processed food sales in the East Asia and Pacific region. So you can see here that um, this is world sales are down on the bottom right. We can see world sales are increasing. We can see some increase in countries in the Middle East and North Africa, some in South Asia, uh, to a lesser extent, extent in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and we even see some declines in North America uh, and in Europe, for example, in certain categories. But we see this huge increase indicated by the red where the red arrows are in processed food sales uh, in East Asia. And we see this uh, markedly in baked goods, dried processed foods, drinking milk products, so this is uh, dairy products, uh, oils and fats, so that's predominantly vegetable oils. And we also see this, and this is quite a unique feature of the East Asia region, we see this huge increase in the sales of um, sauces, dressings, and condiments. So this is those culinary processed food ingredients that I mentioned earlier, which are primarily used in cooking. And that's what, that's a quite an interesting finding because it indicates that a lot of the processed food sales that are being made and uh, that are occurring in East Asia are being used for the purposes of cooking and, and possibly preparing um, uh, traditional dishes. Uh, but I have not confirmed that. That's just uh, a theory. But anyway, this all leads to the question, why are processed food sales increasing so dramatically in East Asia? And I'd say the East Asia, I mean East and Southeast Asia, um, much more so than in other regions. So with, uh, with my colleague, uh, Professor Sharon Friel, we looked into this um, quite closely and we, we mapped out processed food um, sales in different Asian countries. Uh, this includes South Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, and East Asia. What we found was um, this is countries, these are lower middle income countries, including Indonesia, Philippines, India, Vietnam, Pakistan. What we saw was that in, uh, this, this rapid increase in sales in um, lower middle income countries, um, with the exception of the Philippines. Um, which was quite interesting. And I think the theory that we have for that is that the, the Philippines has long been um, influenced by the United States and has long had a processed food diet because of that, um, that, that American influence. That's just a theory we have. We haven't confirmed that or anything, but what we see in, in these other countries uh, is this, this rapid increase. What's interesting is that we see this increase towards more processed foods, but we see a lot of 
country level differences in the volumes and the types of processed foods. So for example, we see a lot of dried processed foods in Indonesia. So these are foods like noodles, uh, dried rice products and so on. In countries like the Philippines, um, we see uh, huge uh, uh, sales of carbonated soft drinks. And in Vietnam, we see, and, and to a lesser extent, Pakistan, we see this rapid increase in dairy uh, products. So the whole region, we see this increase in sales across the region, but we see these uh, interesting differences when we look at individual countries. Okay, so when we look at upper middle income countries like Malaysia, China, and Thailand, um, we see kind of similar and interesting patterns. So in Malaysia, we see this um, notably much higher um, uh, volumes of oils and fats, and that's predominantly uh, vegetable oil. Um, in China, we see this, and in Thailand, we see this increase in dairy products. Um, and in Thailand, we see this um, this very high consumption of high, high sales of carbonated soft drinks. So once again, we see this very interesting, these, these inter-country um, variations. Now, I've showed you these, the scale. If you look on the, the axis on the, on the left-hand side, the vertical axis, you can see the scale is quite different. So the scale is maximum uh, 90, roughly 90 kilograms per capita of sales in Indonesia. It's uh, around about 120 kilograms per capita in China, 180 in Malaysia. And then once we look at Japan, um, those sales volumes are much higher. So up around the sort of the 250 uh, to 260 kilograms per capita. Okay, so um, sales of processed foods are a lot higher in uh, increase uh, quite dramatically as countries um, get richer um, over time. Um, and then you can see the patterns for high income countries. Um, these are interestingly um, much more similar in terms of the um, the volumes and the and the the types of processed foods that are being um, consumed. And it's probably because um, some of these countries share um, certain um, food companies um, and also historical linkages, perhaps. Again, that's, a, that's just another theory. Okay, so when we look at um, how this plays out in terms of the types of nutrients that processed foods are um, delivering into the diets of um, these populations right across Asia, um, we see these these contributions to uh, the salt, fat, and sugar supply. So what we did here was we worked out, based on the ingredients that were being supplied by these different types of foods, um, how much salt, sugar, and fat they were um, supplying to um, high-income, upper-middle-income, and lower-middle-income countries. And what we can see here is a really classic nutrition transition um, uh, profile. So high income countries, uh, we see not much of a change. We see predominant um, uh, beverages are contributing uh, a bit less than processed foods to the sugar supply. Uh, processed foods um, provide predominantly fat and um, we see this rapid increase in middle income countries. Um, that's a really sharp uh, growth trajectory there. Um, and then in lower middle income countries, we see this uh, rapid increase, but from a much lower level. Okay, so this is um, so this work is now being quite highly cited, I think, for this, um, uh, because we were able to demonstrate these links between trends in processed foods uh, and the sales of processed foods and changes in the nutrient supply. Okay, so hopefully by now I've given you some indication of the links between, um, I've told you, what is the nutrition transition and what role does do, do, do processed foods play in the nutrition transition? And I've also told you a bit about the implications for health and also how this is 
um, all playing out in the in the Asia region. What I'd like to talk about now is um, what are the food system drivers of the nutrition transition? Okay, so um, people are not just demanding more processed foods and therefore consuming more processed foods. Um, the reason why people are uh, consuming more processed foods is because they're becoming more available in the food supply, uh, they're becoming more affordable to more people, uh, they're becoming more socially desirable uh, because of more intensive marketing practices, changes in, uh, in, in food cultures, changes in, in food traditions, and also changes in the population age structures. And we see this, um, you know, uh, and, and from a, a demand side perspective, uh, increased processed food uh, consumption in Asia makes a lot of sense because we've seen rapid income growth. So people are getting richer. People are becoming more urbanized. Um, Asia tends to have, Asian countries tend to have much younger populations or they do have young populations and young people tend to uh, be much more open to adopting new types of foods into the diet. Um, but there's also these um, supply side uh, drivers that make processed foods much more available. Um, and I'm going to talk about the supply side drivers in the next, um, in the slides that I will show you next. Okay, so um, when we talk about a food system, we can talk about these food system, what we call the food system drivers. Uh, those are the what we see in the boxes at the very top. Um, demographic drivers, socio-cultural, political and economic, for example. These all influence um, food supply chains. Food supply chains are the, the actors, the processes that take food from production all the way through to um, processing, packaging, and retail. The environments are the interface between um, the, the supply of food and consumers. Um, so here we can talk about the um, food availability, affordability, how intensively advertised these foods are. We can talk about their quality and safety as well. And these all shape um, consumer behavior and ultimately diets and nutrition and health outcomes. Um, and I will just um, point, your, point your attention to the very bottom of that diagram too. In terms of the policies, the political program and institutional actions, so these are really what you might call the policy actions taken to uh, the, the policies that shape um, processed food um, uh, availability, the, the, the supply of processed foods and food environments. Okay, one of the, um, the key parts of the changes in the food system, and this is a, particularly the case in, uh, in Asia, in East Asia and Southeast Asia, is what we call uh, trade liberalization. Trade liberalization is basically the reduction in um, barriers to uh, trade, to food trade and food investment between countries. Okay, so um, in the past, uh, countries have been very protected and closed off to trading food with each other. Um, now they are much more open with their borders. So, so um, food trade, um, food products can now much more easily move across borders. Um, but also um, investments in, in the food system can also occur much more easily. So transnational food companies can much more easily invest in the food systems of other countries now. Um, okay, so this is, um, this is really important in terms of driving the nutrition transition um, because it alters the availability, affordability, and desirability of different types of foods. Um, now, the key pathways we sort of talk about here um, that link trade liberalization with um, the nutrition transition is it facilitates more imports and, and exports of food. Um, it removes restrictions on, like I said, investment by foreign uh, companies 
uh, in the food system. So companies like Coca-Cola or McDonald's, for example, can now more easily invest into countries like Vietnam, like Indonesia. Uh, it also, trade liberalization also removes restrictions on trade in services. And this includes things like supermarkets. So food retail is considered a food service, is considered a service. So this means that um, supermarkets like Glo uh, transnational supermarkets can now more easily move into countries and establish new retail um, establishments. Uh, there's also this, um, uh, it also increases the intellectual property rights of companies. So for example, if, uh, comp if um, uh, um, actually perhaps I won't go into that because it's a little bit too comp uh, a little bit too long-winded, but for now we'll just focus on those those first three key pathways, and I'll show you what I mean by these um, also in a, in a second. Okay, so when we look at um, when we look at the trade in um, processed foods, um, one of the really interesting um, stories I think of processed foods and the nutrition transition is the increased um, availability and the affordability, so the redu reduction in prices of various vegetable oils uh, worldwide. And we see this in particular in East Asia, East and Southeast Asia. Okay, and so since the 1960s, we've seen this massive increase in palm oil production. Okay, and uh, almost all of this new palm oil production is coming from Malaysia and Indonesia. So, when we, um, uh, the graph on the right there shows uh, the increased uh, world palm oil production. Um, so this is resulting from um, massive in, uh, investment into palm oil production in Malaysia and Indonesia. Um, and what we see is that um, uh, on the left, the, the graph on the left there, um, the black indicates what you call the trade balance. So this is the amount of palm oil that is exported minus the amount that is imported. Okay, so you can see in Indonesia and Malaysia about $20 billion US dollars in palm oil was being exported um, from Indonesia and Malaysia respectively in 2014. Okay, so then in very little of that is actually consumed um, within Indonesia and Malaysia. Then when you look at India and China, you can see that their imports are much higher. Um, so they, so I think this tells a really interesting story. Indonesia and Malaysia are producing palm oil. And they're exporting most of that palm oil to India and China where it is consumed. And it's consumed as cooking oil but it's also used in processed food manufacturing. So palm oil um, can be found in, I think it was in, a, in the UK, for example, in about 70% of food of processed food products contain palm oil. So um, this is what I mean by globalization, uh, trade liberalization. The palm oil gets produced in Indonesia and Malaysia. It gets exported to India and China, turned into processed foods and packaged foods. Of which, of which some are then exported to other countries. So that's a really interesting example of what we call this um, trade in goods pathway. Um, and this is, um, we've looked at this in the Pacific. So these are countries um, uh, in the Pacific region um, and how um, a lot of this palm oil is finding its way into upper middle and lower middle income countries in the in the Pacific region. So countries like uh, Fiji, Samoa, uh, Tonga, Tuvalu, uh, importing quite a lot of uh, palm oil and also sunflower oil as well, which is primarily from the United States. Okay, so just to give you another example of how um, this is playing out, um, when we look at soft drink, um, the uh, trade in soft drinks. So soft drinks are different to vegetable oils. Um, soft drinks are uh, 
uh, an ultra processed food. So their um, uh, soft drinks primarily contain sugar and water as the primary ingredients. They're quite heavy. They're quite um, um, expensive to 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 export. And so what we see here is um, very little trade in, in soft drinks. So the trade balance is almost uh, zero in all countries across uh, uh, East and Southeast Asia. And that's really interesting. So um, in, con in contrast, we see this huge, um, you know, levels of consumption in countries like Japan and China, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand. So this really says that these products are, are being produced within the countries. Um, so, um, so soft drinks, uh, so soft drink manufacturing is happening within the country for domestic consumption. It's not being, this is not a product that's being traded across borders. Um, so there are really two companies um, or three companies that dominate soft drink sales in Asia, Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, and Nestle. And they're all transnational corporations that have invested uh, huge amounts of money into establishing production facilities. Uh, this is, uh, you know, factories, distribution networks, and so on, right throughout the uh, Asia region. Okay, so just to give you an example from um, Mexico, um, this is not Asia, but I, I think it demonstrates well how um, rapidly um, this uh, change in soft drink consumption can happen because of trade liberalization. So um, the US signed a trade agreement with the United States back in 1995. It was called the North American Free Trade Agreement. And upon um, almost immediately after signing that agreement, um, the soft drink companies Coca-Cola and Pepsi invested massively in Mexico established new factories and Mexican soft drink consumption uh, tripled in a matter of uh, 20 years. Um, and this uh, is sort of one of the reasons why Mexico became the country with the highest um, obesity rates among highly populated middle income countries. Uh, Venezuela did not sign the free, -to -trade, free trade agreement with the US and consumption volumes um, stayed um, uh, uh, relatively low. Okay, so this is just an example of how um, investment and, and how um, trade liberalization can facilitate changes in the um, supply of processed foods. Another example, and this comes from research that um, I did with some colleagues a few years ago, we looked at what happened when Vietnam signed up to the trade or, uh, World Trade Organization. So um, Vietnam joined the World Trade Organization in um, 2007. Okay, so before 2007, Vietnam was quite closed off to investment by foreign um, food companies. So um, what happened was immediately following um, Vietnam joining the World Trade Organization, reduced its barriers to investment and trade, and we saw this massive increase in foreign direct investment, or FDI. Um, so FDI tripled uh, within uh, just two years. Okay, this um, directly parallel, uh, um, uh, in parallel to this, we saw this uh, rapid increase in the sales of sugar sweetened beverages in Vietnam. So we went from a 3% growth in sugar sweetened beverage sales in 2009, all the way through into um, uh, um, over 20% in 2012. In contrast, the Philippines saw no real change in uh, sugar sweetened beverage market um, as, a, as a comparison country. Okay, in the top right there, we see the companies that have the market share in different Asian countries. And we can see there's Coca-Cola and Pepsi that really dominate Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. So these are 
companies that have much more um, vigorously pursued um, business opportunities, um, market opportunities in Southeast Asia. Another example of this, um, this is a key one I think, is how the retail revolution has played out in Southeast Asia and how increased um, supermarketization. Um, so there are two things here. One is uh, the growth of supermarkets throughout Southeast and East Asia, uh, which, which includes convenience stores. So it's not just large supermarkets like Tesco or Carrefour, uh, it's also convenience stores like 7-Eleven. Okay, and what supermarkets do is they tend to provide, um, uh, they tend to disproportionately distribute processed foods because processed foods um, have higher profit margins, they have longer shelf lives, and so supermarkets tend to sell more processed foods uh, early on in, um, as a country goes through the nutrition transition. Later on, supermarkets tend to bring in more fresh foods, more fruits, vegetables, or whole foods. But I think overall, um, this is something we really have to pay attention to in relation to the nutrition transition. Um, so when we talk about supermarketization, so this is the growth in supermarkets all around the world, um, we really saw this um, uh, kick off in the 1990s, where in countries in East Asia, countries like South Korea and Japan uh, got their supermarkets in the 1990s. We started to see supermarkets move, move into countries throughout Southeast Asia, Thailand and so on, much more in the mid to late 1990s. And then in the early 2000s, in the late 2000s, we started to see um, rapid expansion in China and Vietnam. Okay, and just to give you an example of this in Vietnam, um, and once again, this is linked to this trade liberalization. Um, when Vietnam joined the World Trade Organization in 2007, the number of supermarkets, or in this case, modern retail outlets, increased um, dramatically in, um, in Vietnam. Okay, so you can imagine what Vietnam, Vietnam's retail environment prior to this um, process of supermarketization was largely wet markets, so traditional wet markets, and also small, small grocery stores, essentially. But these supermarkets, these modern retail outlets come in, um, with them, they, they, they bring refrigeration, uh, freezers, um, more processed foods. Uh, and so this is like a, 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 a huge part of the transition towards um, greater processed food consumption. Now, it's not to say supermarkets are not necessarily bad for nutrition in other ways. Um, many supermarkets can provide fresh foods and do provide fresh foods. They often have food safety standards, so you start to see, um, you know, higher food food standards um, come into a country and so on. So it's, there are some positives and negatives for um, of supermarketization. The other key um, thing that we've looked at is also the um, the shift in Asia's fast food sector. Okay, and so what we see here is this um, huge increase in um, in um, transnational fast chain, uh, sorry, chain fast food service providers. So companies like McDonald's, like Yum Brands, which is KFC, um, uh, Starbucks, for example, have rapidly expanded into um, high income countries uh, throughout the region, but they're also increasingly targeting um, upper middle income countries. Um, for example, I think for a while uh, McDonald's was establishing somewhere between four and five hundred new um, stores every year in China alone. So there's been this massive increase in the number of stores um, by some of these fast food companies um, in in certain countries, uh, which is really interesting. So um, it's very much a part of the nutrition transition and processed foods as well, because 
these companies tend to tell us more processed foods. But it also links with this cultural shift as well, um, a shift towards eating more food outside of the home. So, and, and also a shift towards more uh, convenience foods. Okay, so so far I've, st I've spoken mainly about the role of processed foods in the nutrition transition. And the nutrition transition applies broadly to the, the whole population. More well, recently, uh, my research with others has been focusing on what this means for infants and young children in particular. So this is um, infants aged 0 to 12 months and young children aged up to 3 years of age, 36 months. Um, and what, um, what I've been interested in particular is this focus on breast milk substitutes, um, so milk-based uh, infant and young child formulas. Okay, and so um, what we're seeing is this: these media reports of this massive boom in, in the sales of breast milk substitutes um, of, around the world. And this was uh, really interesting um, to look into. Um, you also heard some of these reports from um, that breastfeeding rates were going down in certain countries in um, in the region. Um, we're also hearing reports that it was a, not just infant formula, but also follow-up formula and toddler milks. Okay, and there was almost nothing was being reported on this by WHO, by UNICEF. So we uh, we looked into it in this this paper here, and I actually have a World Health Organization uh, funded project on this topic underway at the moment. We're very much looking into this um, this idea of a um, infant and young child feeding transition. Okay, so it's kind of similar to the this theory of the nutrition transition. Uh, this is something that we've um, we've been trying to develop ourselves a bit more. It's okay, this idea that countries uh, transition from high breastfeeding um, amongst all socioeconomic groups, then as countries become richer, more urbanized, as pregnancy and birthing becomes more medicalized, so you see Caesarean section rates go up as work, the workforce becomes more feminized, um, and we start to see this more intensive marketing of breast milk substitutes. We see a decline in breastfeeding and an increase in um, breast milk substitutes. And this tends to happen first among higher socioeconomic groups and then lower socioeconomic groups. Um, later on, in some countries, not all countries, but some countries, we see this re-emergence of breastfeeding, an increase in breastfeeding, a decline in BMS feeding, and we think this tends to associate with um, stronger policies, regulations, and programming actions to support and protect and promote breastfeeding. So once again, this raises some interesting questions. Why do some countries transition to higher, um, to infant and young child diets that are higher in breast milk substitutes, but others do not transition? And then the other question is, why do some countries transition back to higher breastfeeding rates, but, but not other countries? Um, and this, these are the, the two questions that are really driving my research at the moment. Okay, so when we look at this infant and young child feeding transition, we see something very similar to process, what I've shown you for processed foods. We see uh, this is the sales of um, breast milk substitutes in different regions around the world. So we have infant formula on the left, then follow-up formula, then toddler formula, then standard form, uh, special formula, and finally total milk formula. And what we can see is this massive increase in uh, breast milk substitute sales in East Asia and the Pacific region. Um, and that goes for all of the categories, um, not just infant formula, but also follow-up formula and toddler formula. Okay, so the colored bars are the different years, 2005, 2012, 2018, and we've got some projections there to 2024. So when we look at this at the country level, so this is, um, this is showing data in the sales volumes per infant of standard formula. So this is infant formula for ages zero to five months and 29 days. Uh, and on the, the bottom axis, we have the, the, the growth rate. So this is growth in sales between 2005 and 
2013. Um, and what we see here is uh, if we look at upper middle income countries, we can see uh, China has a uh, uh, probably the world's highest growth rate, um, one of the world's highest consumption volumes, sales volumes, sorry, uh, and, and uh, Thailand has one of the highest sales volumes as well for upper middle income countries. This really tells us something. Uh, it's probably China that is driving the most of the increase in formula sales in East Asia. When we look at lower middle income countries, we can also see um, this transition underway in lower middle income countries. So Indonesia, uh, KHM is um, uh, Cambodia, uh, Vietnam, um, Myanmar, and we've got Laos at the bottom there, and you can see the Philippines is there as well. Um, so you can really see um, this huge increase in um, formula sales, standard formula sales right across the Asia region. When we look at follow-up formula, so this is for ages 6 to 12 months, uh, we see something uh, relatively similar. We see a um, huge growth in um, upper middle and, and lower middle income countries. Um, and this is, um, uh, we, 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 we go into this in quite some depth in our paper uh, as to what might explain this transition. Uh, and it's, it's similar to the, um, some, of, some of the drivers are similar to the nutrition transition, Other, others are, are different. But I think what probably explains it um, uh, to a great extent is the industrialization of these countries. Um, and the shift in work towards uh, working in um, the formal economy, working in factories, working in service jobs, which are not as compatible with breastfeeding, especially uh, when policies are not in place to protect, promote and support breastfeeding. Um, but we're looking into this in, in a lot more detail uh, at the moment. Okay, so I've been speaking for an hour, um, and I haven't really talked about uh, the policy uh, aspects of any of this. So perhaps we can um, focus more on that side of things in the discussion. Uh, and I'm also, of course, completely open to whatever questions um, you'd like you'd like to ask. So thank you for listening to me, um, and I look forward to your questions if you have any. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Are you, are you still there? We are fixing the audio. Okay, so the Can you hear me now? Uh, people are asking questions via the, the yes, chat. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I'll, I'll try to probably. Uh, thanks a lot for your presentation, way. Phil. My pleasure. Uh, I'm wondering about your explanation about plasticizers. So these are the, um, what I mentioned before, these plasticizers that are added to the plastic uh, packaging in front of the they might be leaching into processed foods and having this endocrine disrupting effect, which may contribute to obesity and other uh, conditions. And everyone asks, what do you think about the impact of reheating foods by using micros, safe, and BPA free plastics uh, for our health? Um, Okay, so that's the first question. So I'll just address that. Um, so the the research this is not um, as developed as we would okay, hope it uh, would be at this point. But um, in regards to using microwaves to to eat food to read food, uh, a lot of that happens in the packaging provided by um, the food company, or foods are heated in plastic. Uh, containers in microwaves. Okay, and so this is actually a really important part of the nutrition transition in terms of processed foods because 
what we see is an increase in the sale of the sales of microwaves in countries that are consuming more processed foods. So people can uh, heat their foods or reheat them. Um, for example, ready meals are uh, um, uh, ho you know home pre-prepared meals that people can buy from the supermarket. They can then heat in their in their microwave. Um, and there's some evidence to show. If, um, my understanding is there's some evidence to show that um, the heating of these plastics can increase the 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 leachate from these um, of, of these plasticizers into the food. So there is some risk there. Although I would have to look into that uh, research a bit more to be sure, to be certain. So maybe you'd like to look into that. Um, there's also this, a lot of food companies now are now using what they call BPA-free plastic um, packaging. Um, the problem with this is that there's not just BPA, this is bisphenol, uh, I can't remember the full name of the chemical, but it's bisphenol something A. There's also BPB, BPC. There are a number of other um, variations of these chemicals, which are, all, which, which are often still... Um, uh, in the packaging. So uh, once again, this is, um, you know, this is, uh, I'm not an expert on this, and I, I think I'd really encourage you to look at the research yourself. That's just my um, um, my understanding of it. Okay, I have this uh, second question here. Um, so with the transition, um, it's not only for infant and toddler formula, but also prepared food for infants and toddlers. Okay, so this is these uh, complementary foods. So these are foods um, that are prepared uh, for the consumption by infants and young children after uh, six months of age. Um, they're, they're sometimes they're consumed earlier. Uh, and you'll see these companies, like companies like Nestle, are now selling these complementary foods or have been selling these foods for a long time. Um, and they're often, um, you know, processed foods or ultra processed foods um, and I'm, I'm not really sure what to recommend be, um, in terms of how to counteract this beyond just sort of saying well we need to just um, uh, uh, promote uh, home prepared complementary foods as much as we can as as infants and young children have been consuming for you know many hundreds of years um so and i'm not too sure uh the world health organization has recently changed their or has released some advice on the marketing of complementary foods um so you might like to have a look at some of the uh the new reports coming out of the who for more information on on that okay so i have some more questions here thanks for all of your questions uh these are really good uh, okay, so from um, regarding your last two slides, what is the nutrition transition from high income countries? Is it human milk or um, something else? Um, okay, so for high income countries, we're seeing this infant and young child feeding transition where um, it's kind of like at the end stage of the transition where some countries are now going back to higher breastfeeding. Um, and to be honest, I'm not sure if it's, um, we, we're certainly seeing a decline in formula consumption in some countries and increased in breastfeeding rates in the same countries. Uh, the United States, for example, we're seeing an increase in breastfeeding in certain states uh, and a decline in, in, in the sales of infant formula. We're seeing that also in some um, uh, high-income countries. You can see here um, countries like Japan, Korea, Finland, countries of, um, countries of uh, Eastern Europe, we're seeing these negative growth in infant formula sales, um, which indicates that they are 
potentially shifting back towards higher breastfeeding rates. And, and, and that's indicative of human milk consumption. But we're not actually sure, and this is something we have to, uh, we're investigating at the moment. Um, we're put, trying to put some, some data and evidence to this to show that these are countries that are going through this transition back to breastfeeding. Um, unfortunately, what we see in these same countries is, and here's the data for, um, we look at the data for follow-up formula, we can see that uh, almost all countries have positive growth in follow-up formula. So not many countries that have negative growth in follow-up formula. So yeah, we're starting to see increased breastfeeding to six months. We're starting to see declines in infant formula, uh, but we're seeing this uh, continued growth in follow-up formula and toddler formula. And we're also seeing uh, huge amounts of growth in special formulas as well. So these are, these are formulas sold for medical conditions. Uh, they include soy-based um, formulas. Um, so there's, there's some interesting um, developments going on here. Okay, so next question. Um, okay, this next question is on the NOVA food classification. Um, we have Aziza who's doing her uh, there. He or she is doing her thesis on ultra-processed foods and the NOVA food classification. Can you give me some tips on how to classify these foods uh, correctly? Okay, so my advice there if in terms of applying the NOVA food classification is really to uh, have a look at the publications by Carlos Montero. Um, there are a series of these publications. Uh, sorry, there are, uh, are a number of these publications that Carlos and his team have published uh, going back, uh, I think it's about five years now. Okay, and the, 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 food class, the NOVA food classification has changed um, over time. So there have been um, changes in the, the foods that are included in the different categories. Um, but the most recent um, publication, I think, is, is, is most up, up to date. So I would just have a look at those. They have examples of, so in those papers, they have the, the definitions of the different um, NOVA food categories, and they also have uh, a lot of examples as well. Um, it depends on the data that you're using. If you're using um, mixed data or DHS data, the survey data uh, based on food frequency, um, you'll have to um, apply that. There's also the, um, uh, you can also use Euromonitor data and try and classify the Euromonitor um, uh, processed food data by NOVA food classification. Uh, the second thing I can recommend doing there is to actually contact um, one of Carlos Montero's team members and they can actually probably directly help you with that. Okay, another question here. Uh, what do you think should be done as the effort to intervene the massive trade in the massive trade of breast milk substitutes um, that contradicts with low implementation of breastfeeding friendly policies? This is one of the big problems in Indonesia. Uh, thanks for this question. I think this is probably one of the most uh, important questions to ask. Um, a really good question to ask uh, and. Um, when we look at the, um, the, the massive growth in breast milk substitute consumption in East and Southeast Asia, um, this is really affecting um, more infants and young children than ever before in human history when you take into consideration the size of the populations affected by this. Um, that's infants, young children, and mothers, of course, as well, because um, not breastfeeding has implications for maternal health. Um, and this really is um, um, a trade issue in many ways. Um, and so what we see is these, um, these formula companies are operating very intensively in countries in the region. Uh, we see it in particular in China where uh, Nestle, Danone, Mead Johnson, Abbott Laboratories, um, 
um, and we see some Chinese companies are, are competing ferociously to um, to sell their products in China. We're also seeing that in other countries in the region, like Indonesia, for example. Um, and uh, there have been, um, of course, a lot of efforts to regulate the sale of these products, including implementation of the uh, the code of marketing on breast milk substitutes, uh, but also the adoption of other breastfeeding friendly policies like um, the baby friendly um, hospital initiative. What we don't have a good understanding of yet is why some countries are adopting strong policy responses and other countries are not adopting very strong policy responses. So we've seen in Vietnam, um, the Vietnamese government has um, adopted a relatively strong stance on the sale of breast milk substitutes and adopted a number of uh, breastfeeding friendly policies. We've seen a extensive regulation of breast milk substitutes in India is another country where uh, this, these products have been highly regulated. Uh, but I'm not too sure about, I know, I know um, Indonesia scores very highly on the uh, World Breastfeeding Trends Initiative, which indicates relatively strong policy uh, policies in place. Um, I've heard uh, reports that um, there's been low implementation of some of these policies in uh, certain countries. Um, and limited monitoring and enforcement of the the um, breast milk substitute marketing regulations. What we need more research on is this this topic, and this is something that um, some some colleagues and I are looking into very closely at the moment as part of a um, WHO funded study. Uh, but I would like to hear more um, from anyone who. You know, is interested in this topic, um, please feel free to to get in touch with me by email. Um, and I think you'd probably people on this call, uh, people who are listening in the audience, would have a much better understanding of how this is playing out um, within countries. So I'd love, I'd very much like to learn from 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 members of the audience um, about what they think about this 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 problem. Uh, and, and also what they think we can uh, do about it. I think uh, it's fair to say that the the influence of the formula companies uh, and this role of trade policy is um, very much an important feature of this problem. And that's something that we're looking um, very closely at. Okay, I have another question here. Um, ultra processed foods are relatively lower in cost and they are also time saving relative to uh, unprocessed foods and therefore have become mums the favorites of for, for mums for moms in preparing breakfast and other meals um, so this is uh, an interesting um, part of the nutrition transition is that it's something I didn't really talk about but Processed foods um, save time because what what really happens is you know we um, as countries become richer and they people start to work more in formal jobs um, we see this increase in time pressure uh, for families or some people say. We don't see an increase in time pressure, we just see an increase in the perception of time pressure. And one thing that the processed food companies do is they sell us these products in order to save us time. So they'll sell us ready meals that we can microwave, we can heat, uh, pre-packaged breakfast cereals or rice products, for example, that we can put in the microwave and prepare. And also fast food companies can also, you know, McDonald's, KFC, um, you know, we, we, they, they can provide us with, with um, meals, very affordable meals, uh, very quickly. Okay, and so this is one reason why we see this increase in, in sales uh, that goes on. 
So this is very much a part of the nutrition transition is this time cost of preparing, sourcing food that um, these, these processed foods then, um, then provide. Um, so I think when we talk about how to respond to um, uh, processed foods from a policy perspective, we need to pursue policies that also change the time availability that um, that, that parents, that people have to source and prepare their foods. Um, so maternity protection, for example, if um, a country has weak uh, maternity protection policies and, um, you know, mums and dads have to go back to work very early after giving birth, they have less time to prepare those you know, to breastfeed, but also to prepare those complementary foods, for example. Um, so we need to consider this this aspect of, of time. Um, the other element of this is that as we, um, as fast food becomes more prevalent in a country, uh, people start to eat more outside of the home. So people stop eating as much in, in home with their family or friends, and they start to eat more outside of the home with their family and friends. And this uh, has implications too, because what we what we might see is a decline in the culinary skills that people have. So the skills they have to source food, to prepare food, uh, and it also changes uh, how we eat food at meal times as well. I mean, eating together, eating together as a family. Okay, so I think these are important things to research, to understand. Um, you know, it's not necessarily to say that food out of eaten outside of the home is always better or, or, or sorry, it's always worse than food uh, prepared in the home. But um, but I think there is some evidence to some evidence uh, from some countries to suggest that. Uh, but I would I would encourage. Uh, no more uh, investigation on that. Okay, so I've got another question here. The government's food policy may temporarily protect Indonesians from food insecurity in times of international food price spikes. Okay, um, but it creates serious problems and contributes to chronic food insecurity among Indonesia's um, poor. No food ethic as a food guideline here. Indonesians typically purchase groceries fresh every day from traditional retailers, which control around 80% of the grocery market. Um, do you have any other perspectives about this, um, uh, these, these developments? Um, Okay, so I think what you're talking about there with um, this idea of international food price spikes was um, international food price volatility can create problems for food security, as we saw in 2008. And this is a thing with trade liberalization that as countries trade more food, with one another, they become more dependent on one another for their food security. But sometimes we see this increase in international food prices, which um, can jeopardize food security. And we actually saw that quite extensively in um, the Middle East, Middle Eastern countries in 2008, for example, where, where food prices went up um, massively. And I think in a few, a few Asian countries as well, um, so one way that governments um, respond to this is by um, making more food, um, uh, available, uh, in um, staple foods like rice or maize. Um, uh, however, in the long run, if that's not done well, that can contribute to chronic food insecurity when we don't see 
um, investments made in supporting um, local food systems, uh, production of uh, domestic foods, and also, um, you know, policies that reduce reliance on these um, imported foods. But I don't really have a response to that. Um, uh, it's a pretty complicated question because, um, you know, the more integrated the world's becoming with trade liberalization, the more interdependencies we see. Um, but I think we need to work on this a lot more, understand it a lot better. And um, a lot of people are looking into this. Um, so that's not a very good answer. Okay, another question. Um, um, does the nutrition labeling or health star rating, um, is it still relevant guidance to changing consumer demand for healthier choices of packaged foods? Okay, so this is a question about um, front of pack nutrition labeling um, um, and the health star rating. The health star rating is a, a rating, uh, a front of package labeling system that we have here in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, it indicates the um, the healthfulness of a food based on zero to five stars. Um, and there's some evidence to say that the the health star rating system is um, uh, working to guide food choices. However, um, there are still a lot of products that are getting very high ratings, which shouldn't be. So a lot of breakfast cereals, a lot of um, sugary drinks are getting high health star ratings. Um, and this is uh, causing a lot of concern amongst nutritionists in Australia. Um, and I think it's something to do with the, the how the the how it's designed. Um, and there's a it's a it's a little bit too complex to go into here. But the other problem with the health star rating system is that it's not um, mandatory. It's still voluntary. And so only about thirty percent of packaged food products have a health star rating on them. Okay, so that's a, a big problem because it's not being implemented. Uh, it's a voluntary scheme. It's not being the uptake of it has been quite low. Um, when we look at um, the emerging evidence on nutrition labeling as a policy intervention, um, we see uh, studies from different countries around the world. So France has the NutriScore. Uh, in Latin America, we've seen the 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 stop sign. Uh, um, which uh, studies indicate the, the stop sign that's being used in countries like Chile um, appears to be highly effective and um, much more effective than, um, than other schemes like NutriScore, like Health Star Rating, uh, uh, like Traffic Light Labeling. So I would encourage you to look at that. I think the uh, it might be the... World Cancer Research Fund has a, um, some guidance on this and has a summary of recent evidence um, that would be, um, you know, really good to look into. Okay, so um, those are all of the questions that I've um, received. And it's now coming up uh, one and a half hours, so I will stop there and um, say thank you very much for joining um, the presentation today. It's been a, um, I hope what I've spoken about has made some sense and has been useful for you. Um, and like I said, if you have any questions or if you'd like to share uh, anything with me, um, please email me on this um, email address here. Uh, and in particular, I'd love to hear from you about um, this issue of breast milk substitutes and breastfeeding how that's playing out in your country, some of the policy issues that you're facing, anything like that, um, please, do, um, to, please do be in touch. So thank you again. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you so much. I know it's still very.
Yeah, I think uh, this is going to wrap up a lot of discussion has come out. Um, uh, it is clear that the patient feel both their breath. We really uh, have uh, seen how much uh, trade uh, policies influence uh, the additional problem that they're coming to Thank you so much for your time, Phil. I am sure with the email address now posted in front of the uh, screen, everyone will start uh, emailing you questions and hopefully uh, the special will come along. Thank you again. Uh, thank you for everyone attending this session online. Uh, see you again in the next uh, round of uh, online lecture series. Coming up soon is uh, the one by Dr. Young in December 19. We will be uh, sharing you the, uh, the flyers of the event soon. Thank you so much. Bye.